Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's conversation with Cabral. I have Rachel Brayton with me here today from Yoga Girl. Really excited, Rachel, to have you here on the show. Thank you so much for having me. This is going to be great. I really, I, yoga is something that I've always been a big believer in. It's one of those things that I seem to go in and out of, you know, really for the last 15 years or so that I'm looking to develop more of my own um, specific practice. And I believe yoga can really be specific to the individual. So again, for personal reasons, really looking forward to the conversation here with you today, but also practical tips that you're going to be able to give people to invite yoga into their own lives. Great, great. Yeah. I mean, it's something that for me, really, the beauty of yoga is that we can adapt it to fit our lives wherever we are. That's the beauty of the practice, that it's really for everyone. There's a lot of myths around who can or should practice yoga, and I'm always happy to to bust those. So happy to be here. Yeah. W- when did you first start getting into yoga yourself? Uh, was this always a lifelong passion of yours or did it just develop or suddenly come into your life uh, at a certain age that you needed it? Uh, Definitely not a lifelong thing. I mean, as I get older, it feels like a lifelong thing, but um, I found meditation first. So the asana part of the practice, the physical postures came into my life a little bit later. I started meditating after my mom sent me to a meditation retreat in my teens. I was a really tumultuous rebel Um, drinking a lot of alcohol, doing drugs, smoking cigarettes, kind of teenage years. And uh, as kind of a last resort, she sent me to a meditation retreat, hoping I would kind of get my things together. And it completely changed my life. So I I had about a year or two of of a pretty serious meditation practice Mm. before I was introduced to yoga. And I actually found asana through my back pain. I had a lot of back pain my whole life. And someone said, well, you're meditating already. Why don't you try yoga, it's going to help your back. And it did. Excellent. So you got into the meditation first, mainly kind of forced upon you uh, for your own good. And um, that, what, what did that look like? Meaning that obviously as a teenager, I know myself as a teenager, uh, probably a little rebellious myself as well. It wouldn't be something that I would even be interested in. So how did that work for you? Did you get like, where was the retreat center? Was it completely isolated from the rest of the world? Yeah, I mean, so I'm Swedish. I am born and raised in Sweden. So I was in a really remote part of Sweden. And I think back to this time all the time because it really was one of those moments of just grace. You know, I didn't have a single person in my life um, that was into meditation or any kind of wellness or health practice of any kind. And my mom had been to this meditation center. And I remember really seeing a significant shift in her just a a little, like an undercurrent of peace. We had less of a, um, less altercations between her and I, I just noticed something shifted for the better in her. So uh, it was really like, she sent me kind of, you know, it's this or you're out of the house kind of thing. And something in me said, well, okay. And I think deep down, I must have felt this deep longing to change my life because I really wasn't happy. But that that doesn't mean it came easy. You know, I I was, there was so much resistance. I had to take a train a couple of hours to get there. And then I got in the cab to go to the retreat center. And halfway there, I had almost like a panic attack. And I told the the cab driver, you know what? Actually, I changed my mind. Take me back to to the train station. And he stopped the car. And I feel like he was really like sent from God, stopped the car and told me, you know, I've seen so many people go to this place. I've picked up so many nervous people from the train station. Mm -hmm. Here's my number. Go for one day. And if it's bad tomorrow, call me and I'll pick you up. And, you know, I went and I stayed and it completely changed my life. I think about that guy all the time. Oh, that's amazing. I mean, no, there, there are certain people that are absolutely sent to you, I believe. And uh, that's that's serendipity right there at its best to be able to meet someone like that where, you know, he has no relationship to you, no, you know, job that he has to say you need to make it to this particular center. So, that, I mean, that's that's amazing. I'd love to hear stories like that. So when you got there, you at least went in with an open mind. And do they kind of just thrust you into things or do they treat you like a beginner into meditation? And the reason I'm asking is that there's a lot of people right now that know they should be meditating. I mean, who doesn't know that they shouldn't be meditating, but most people just aren't willing to make the commitment because it's on them. And, you know, now you're at the center, you're almost forced to do it. What's the best way? Maybe it was the best way, but, but what's the best way you found to kind of ease into meditation? 
I mean, this being thrust into, you know, a seven day completely out of your environment, you know, with a brand new group of people, everything new, uh, definitely wasn't an easing in type of type of transition in. But I really think that at that point in my life, it was the only thing that could have woken me up. Yeah. I think if someone had said, hey, you know, doesn't it looks like you're not feeling great. Um, why don't you try meditating 20 minutes twice a day? I would have laughed, you know, and gone about my my day, I think. So sometimes having one of those a little bit more more intense experiences where you kind of don't really have a choice. And I know now with COVID and everything, it's, it's hard to, to find those, those types of experiences, but there are options online as well. Um, I have on my own site, like an online retreat where you really commit from home from morning till evening to be in this practice. So for me at that time, this kind of meditation also is a little bit radical. It's a meditation and therapy practice that stems from um, the Osho teachings, which is a very radical, radical spiritual guru who's not not with us anymore. So it was a combination of active meditations, of sitting meditations and therapeutic exercises all the way through. And that combination for me at that time really changed my life. But not safe to say that if you have no kind of sitting practice, having five minutes a day And that can be five minutes a day where it's okay that your mind is busy, where maybe you spend those five minutes thinking about your to-do list or what you're going to make for dinner or, you know, to have that consistency of, I have five minutes a day where I sit in silence. I really believe that that kind of, you know, which feels like a small shift, it changes something in our vibration and also in how we open up to that silence in a new way. So both avenues, I think, are, are great. But for me, that kind of harsh <laughs> reality of here is something totally new um, really worked for me. Yeah, and then for me, all of the, the teachings that I've ever had in terms of meditation, uh, although, you know, I have some practice in, in TCM and some others, um, or I should say transcendental, transcendental meditation, so TM. But I, I'd like to know a little bit more about the, when you say active-based meditation, because I have my own version of active meditation uh, and some of those techniques and exercises, are those things that you teach or really they were taught to you, you use them, but they're not something that you would pass down or, or have people do on their own? Um, both, actually. So some of them I do. Are you familiar with Osho at all? I'm he's not. Kind no, of- no, I'm not. Okay, like so more. he's he, he's he's become a little more. Um, he's very very well known in Europe. There's still a lot of Osho centers for meditation all across Europe. Um, but there is a documentary on Netflix that came out a couple of years ago called Wild Wild Country about his mm. ashram, which was a very oh, controversial thing. There was a lot of strange, you know, things that went that came with his teachings at the time of like of his biggest when he had the most influence. I think so. People are. Um, sometimes I'll, I, I'll just say I do an active meditation, but I don't mention Osho because people go, oh, I would never, that's not mm. for me. But, um, his meditations, there's tons, but the one that's the most popular, it's called a dynamic meditation okay. where it's an hour. It's the most physically exhausting thing you'll ever do in your life because it's physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally just kind of turns you inside out, um, where you do breath work. And then there is a component to it that includes emotional release where you have a 10 minute space to act out and release out into the open, whatever emotion is moving through you in that moment, which you know, sometimes sure can look like joy and you dance or you sing or you're shaking or you're just moving your body with freedom, but most often looks like anger, you know, can look Mm -hmm. like screaming, can look like physical ways to release anger or sadness or grief. So when you're doing a dynamic meditation in a room of people, it looks like a madhouse, you know, it's Mm -hmm. totally wild. And then from there, there are other stages that take you into a place of complete silence. So his whole idea was kind of like the Western mind is so busy just sitting down and telling people to stop thinking doesn't work. We have to give ourselves an avenue for all that crazy monkey mind stuff to come out first before we arrive into stillness. And I teach it in retreats. I teach it in teacher trainings. It's really um, a practice that works. But again, it's, it's kind of overwhelming. So I like to, depends on the group, but I teach all kinds of meditations from that quiet sitting down, close your, close your eyes and just be here to the more, um, radical ones. But I find both are great. I think the body is important to include the body in these practices a lot, which yoga helps with too, of course. Yeah, without a doubt. And we're, we're big since we're, we're teaching a lot on the autonomic nervous system is being able to release um, into the subconscious <clears throat> and the subconscious really being tied to our nervous system rather than just our brain. So 
I love the idea of that. I mean, I'm a big advocate of people need to learn to also uh, sit in quiet and sit with themselves and a little bit more into self-awareness. But at the same time, we need to meet people where they are. And we can't always expect people to just say, okay, I'm going to turn everything off, shut everything off and just force myself to meditate. One, And I'd like to hear your thoughts on this as well. But we've had a lot of uh, breathwork experts uh, on the show and on the podcast. And one of the things that I learned, my background is as a doctor of naturopathy and a lot into functional medicine, Ayurvedic medicine. I did a lot of my internships in Europe and and in India as well. And when I was in India uh, and I was doing some of the yoga based work because yoga is part of the Ayurvedic system is uh, that we would concentrate on 10, 12 different forms of breathing. And each one seemed to elicit a little bit different response from the body. Do you use breath work in your practice and maybe in some of your meditations as well? I do. I do. Absolutely. And for me, it's always, it's always one of those kind of mind blowing moments where something as simple as breathing through your mouth with an open mouth for, for an extended period of time can unlock all of these things from the nervous system. Um, and I really think the in, in the body, we have so much that's kind of kept under lock and key because we're not, yeah, we live in a society where it's hard for us to be our true authentic selves. And we're kind of raised that way to keep it together at all times. And I think the breath is such a, it's, it's, it's just a key to unlock things that have been stuck in the body. And also, of course, used in trauma healing and um, more therapeutic and, and go, going a little bit deeper into that area as well. But it, I, it really works. For me, it's something that really works. But um, practicing breath work, it's one of those things that I, at least I don't teach online. It's, it's something that I think should happen really with a professional, preferably in the room, uh, or at least someone who has really extensive training and a lot of experience because it can feel really overwhelming. Sure. Without a doubt. Now, when you first, so you, you went to the meditation clinic, we'll call it, uh, you, the retreat, you had your time there. What did the follow-up to that look like? Did you immediately begin to implement it in your life? Did you do a full 180 and start to turn things around? Or was it then a slow progression over time of kind of finding yourself and, and moving into yoga? It was a 180 for sure. I think mm-hmm. within the span of, I went back to the center again for another, another course, a 10 day one. Um, and within a year I had broken up with my boyfriend of four years. I had a new set of friends. I had stopped smoking. I quit drinking and I moved across the world from Sweden to Costa Rica and spent Mm. the next three years there. So it was really a, yeah, (laughs) 180 game changer degree shift. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when you went to Costa Rica, was that to study yoga, live more natural lifestyle? What, What did that look like? Um, I didn't set out to do that. Um, at the time I was still just, when I moved there, I was still just, and I say just meditating, but it's funny, you know, yoga really was created as an aid for meditation. Mm -hmm. So it's really the, um, just a tool to help us go deeper, but I wasn't physically practicing yoga at the time. Um, and chose Costa Rica because I I speak Spanish and I've spoken Spanish my whole life and I wanted to be in a Spanish speaking place and I wanted to be in the jungle and yeah, looking for something more natural. And really early on in that I was supposed to go for three months, ended up staying almost three years. And in the first, first month, um, a person said, Oh, you have back pain. Cause I had a lot of back pain and, and had my whole life. Um, why don't you go to the yoga studio in town? It's amazing. Yoga can really help you. And I was fortunate enough to find, first of all, a teacher that was really gentle, um, a style of practice that was really inviting and inclusive um, because I couldn't touch my toes. I had, I had lower back pain and mid back kind of between shoulder blades pain, um, where I could in the morning, like turn my head to turn off my alarm or bend forward to tie my shoes. And I would throw my back out and be out for two weeks. Um, so I was really lucky to find a kind of yoga that allowed for me to enter at my own pace. And that's something that I think is important to keep in mind because so much of the yoga that we see in the West and in studios now across the States and and everywhere, um, can be fairly intense and, you know, vinyasa style yoga practices. If you've never bent forward to try to touch your toes before, I think it's better to start with something more therapeutic for sure. 100%. And, and, you know, a couple of thoughts on that as well as one, I spent a a few weeks in Costa Rica. It's it's been a little while now, but one of my favorite places I've ever visited. And just because of the people, the lifestyle, the culture, the food, it's just, it's, it's amazing. It really is. I know it's being a little bit more built up right now, which again, obviously has its 
pros and cons for the people that live there and, and tourism and all that. But uh, there's something really special, you know, about about that place. Really enjoyed my time there, just being in the jungles there. But one thing that you mentioned struck a big chord with me because for the most part, when I'm recommending yoga, uh, I'm always recommending a form of hatha yoga. So I'm recommending something that people can focus, just like you said, more on your breath, more on the meditative part of it rather than the sport of yoga. And in the West, we turn everything into a competition. And for me, it's like, well, that was never what yoga was meant to be. As yoga progressed, and at least in Ayurveda, uh, it was always meant uh, for a specific purpose. So it might be meant for more of the kapha body type or endomorph body type to really progress through it a little bit more vigorously and rigorously for their body type. Um, but so that's why I, I just recommend at least start with the foundation, like the knowledge of the breath matching up with the particular poses, et cetera, to, to maximize the benefits. And it sounds like, although I don't want to put words in your mouth, uh, you're at least along that same line of, of easing into yoga. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's really true, you know, in, in this, this society, this part of the world, we do everything so quickly and everything has to happen with so much intensity. And I, I, I sit with this a lot because even in my own practice, I have it very ingrained that I am supposed to sweat when I'm on my yoga mat. I'm like yoga is supposed to look like something because every teacher I had up until a certain point taught in that way where you're supposed to push, you're supposed to be out of your comfort zone, you're supposed to grow all the time, get to the next pose or deepen the pose or advance or this idea of, of being having an advanced practice. And it really harmed me for a while just having that mindset in terms of I have to go to the next place when yoga really is about how can I be exactly where I am and yes. really allow for that. And if that's uncomfortable or I feel pain or I feel tightness or I feel weak, that I can be here in that and take another breath into that versus how can I push a little harder? And right. it's, uh, it's something that I, I, I catch myself even when I'm teaching now. Um, I have to be so anchored in myself as I teach or my practice that I, or the class I'm teaching, it starts to speed up because it's just, it's in my nature also to do things a little bit quicker, you know? So without the yoga practice, without my meditation practice, I, I would be on the moon or something. It's really, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's really, really, really helpful for me in every way. Well, that, and that I agree that yoga is that great balancer. So especially in the West, if we're always moving forward in career and family and in exercise and workouts, yoga is supposed to be the thing that helps to balance that, that in meditation, mm -hmm. the slowing process, uh, at least, you know, in my opinion, now for other people, it can actually be their workout. It can be their all in one, which is great as well. But, um, I, I think we have to know our purpose. We have to set an attention when we begin any of these new endeavors and, and yoga would be included with that. So I'd like to hear, um, when you, you're in Costa Rica, you're obviously now in yoga, helping with your back. Did you begin to go through a certification process down there? Did you begin to teach? When did that occur? Um, no, I started teaching at the end of my, of my stay and I was just very immersed in the practice by then. And it was just part of my, part of my life, part of my routine. And as often happens when you find something that changes your life, something that helps you, um, for the first time in my life. So I was 19 at the time. Um, for the first time in my life, I, I, I was free from back pain, you know, and that was such a massive, massive, massive thing in my life. Cause I had been uh, yeah, suffering since I was in my teens, since I was 12 or, or, or maybe even 11. So of course I wanted to tell everyone, Hey, you should try this thing, you know, come to yoga class. Let me, let me show you, here's what we do. And, um, I started teaching a little bit more organically to friends, um, to people that I worked with. And then I, uh, I went to Aruba on vacation, actually still living in Costa Rica. And I met, um, my husband who's now my husband, um, became my boyfriend. And when I moved here, I had this kind of blank slate, um, what do I want to do with my life? And the only thing that really came to mind was, wow, I want to, I want to go deeper into sharing this practice. Mm -hmm. So that's when I got certified and started teaching properly. So when you began, uh, first teaching did th these were in-person classes, we're going back a few years. Uh, you actually set, did you set up your own studio where you're teaching another studio and what type of yoga were you teaching at the time? I started teaching. So this is what, 11 years ago now. I've been here a long time. I'm still living in Aruba today. Um, but I started teaching on the beach. I would go um, rally people literally off their lounge chairs at different hotels here um, and try to try to explain what yoga was. People didn't really know. Um, locally here in Aruba, yoga was really 
pretty non-existent. People were nervous at the idea of it being something religious. It's a very Catholic island. And I, I kept getting a lot of resistance of, oh, oh, but I'm not into Buddhism or Hinduism, you know. Um, so I, I, it was challenging in the beginning. In the beginning, if I had four or five people come to class, I was elated. And we were on, uh, you know, beach towels in the sand, basically. I was under a little grape tree on the beach. And then uh, eventually I got hired by the hotel that I was teaching in front of. And um created a position for myself there as yoga director and built out a big yoga space and then started inviting teachers to come from abroad to lead teacher trainings and retreats and did that for a couple of years really really happy it was kind of like I <laughs> I think of it now like I created a space where I could train under these amazing world-class teachers without having to go anywhere and I could do it for free because I got to participate in all those groups that um, that I brought to the hotel so it was a lot of fun and then eventually yeah, this was what, 2012 or 2013, um, I started dabbling a little bit in social media for the first time and was sharing, you know, I don't know if you remember early days of Instagram when it was mostly pictures of people's dogs and breakfasts and <laughs> people used Instagram just like, here's what I'm doing right now and nothing to that. And then I, I realized pretty quickly, every time I shared something relating to my yoga practice, I got a lot of response mm. or people asking, oh, you know, could you help me with that? Or um, how can I do this pose? Or just a lot of, a lot of engagement there. So I started focusing, um, focusing my social media presence there. And this was at a time where yoga on social media was... Uh, you know, it was it, it was not on Instagram for sure. It, it kind of existed a little bit on Facebook that people could have a page you could follow to get information about classes and things like that. But people thought it was a very strange thing to be doing yoga on the internet or to, um, I would, I started traveling and I started teaching in other places. And then uh, I would go to studios and say, Hey, I would love to have a class here. And they said, Oh, I've never heard of you. How are you going to fill the class? And I said, Oh, through Instagram. And they would laugh at me literally. Yeah. Oh, no, thank you. No, no, we, we don't have space for you here. So it was very early days. It was different from now, you know, now everyone is, is doing that same thing in that same space. Well, I'm, I'm glad you got there early. You know, you have a good message to share and you're able to, uh, you've grown now to, to many millions of followers on Instagram. I was actually interested uh, what your early days posting looked like because I, of course, uh, know your account now, but um, people, it obviously struck a chord. So what were you posting? Let's just say as it began to get more popular, were you actually putting out full poses? Were you saying, okay, this pose is used for this, I'm working on this, or were you just kind of sharing your experiences? Yeah, I think in the beginning when I realized, oh, I, I have something here, you know, people are really interested in this. This is, it was exciting. I, I had this idea, okay, I'm going to use this, this platform as a way to really share yoga. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would post pictures of myself in yoga poses with the Sanskrit name of the pose, um, contradictions for the pose, how to like very, you know, dun, 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 here's how you do it kind of. Um, and I would only share yoga related things or things that related to health, like a green juice or, you know, look, look at me and this perfect yoga lifestyle that I was living. And I did that for a little while and saw a lot of response. And then I, I remember I had this very defining moment and this was pretty early on, thank God, within my first year of, of being present online where I was having a really horrible time in my life. I was having a big struggle with my, with my boyfriend, who's now my husband. Um, just a lot of personal stuff not going well. And I remember one day, and I wrote this beautiful caption about life being amazing and take care of your heart and something, something. And I just wasn't feeling that way. You know, it was a total lie. Like I was basically sharing this big lie of look at my perfect life, where in, in reality, it was not perfect at all. So I decided why am I doing this? Let me just, let me just speak the truth of what's going on. And I shared this moment of, I am feeling insecure. I'm feeling jealous. I feel like my life is falling apart. And for the first time being present online ever, I got a response that felt like a conversation versus me kind of announcing something. And then people just looking at that. Um, I got a response from people that said, wow, I'm going through the same thing. You know, have you tried this? Here's my point of view, or just I'm feeling the same. And the fact that you're feeling the same makes me feel like I'm less crazy or like I'm less alone. And that was a really important moment for me because I, in that instant, I, I decided I'm not going to do it this way. I don't want to pretend to be this perfect person. Let me share what's really true and what's, re what's really real. And that's kind of the philosophy I've kept since then, which, 
yeah, it probably if I would have kept it at that very, you know, surface, pretty yoga poses kind of thing, maybe I would have had a bigger following by now because that's what really attracts a lot of attention. Mm. But instead, what I have is a really committed community of people versus people who just follow along and don't really know what they're what they're following. So I feel like I can really tell the truth and be honest and um, hopefully be a little corner of the Internet where people can come and feel less alone. With, I, mean, I think it's just far more genuine and that's really what's missing on a lot of social media today is that people are using it just to gain follower count and and not really letting people know who they are or, or giving back, I think, in a deeper way. And the, the truth is that, you know, there's only one you. And so when you share your information, it can't be copied. But anybody, I think, could now create a yoga pose and, and, and people do, right? And they say, okay, they can do all of those technical-based things. But the nice thing is, and I just try to share my viewpoint on this, is that um, you can do all the other things that everybody else is doing and people can copy you, but it's always from your vantage point. And if you don't share that, then there's really nothing unique about you. And obviously, um, you know, people have connected with you. What do you what do you think one of the major reasons are or is that people have said uh, whatever it is, whatever style of yoga that you are sharing with people and the message that that people really are connecting because they are. There's just no doubt about that. What is different? I mean, I think one of the things that I do that is fairly different because there's a lot of there's a lot more authenticity online now. There really is. You don't have to, you can curate a a community of people that you follow online who do tell the truth, people who are really body positive, people who are really inclusive, um, people who do amazing activism within yoga and within wellness. So there is a lot of good stuff out there. I think where something that I still do, and this is just because I am that kind of person and this works for me, is I can talk really openly about the really, really hard stuff. So... um, For instance, my my best friend passed away. This was a couple of years back. And it was really in the middle of me being really, really present online and touring the world. I had a 36-stop tour where I was just teaching yoga to thousands of people. Like I was living this very strange, (laughs) strange, strange lifestyle. And in the middle of all of that, my best friend passed away in a car accident. And I could have, you know close the account down. I could have been quiet for two months and then come back as if nothing had happened. Um, I could have pretended. And instead I, I decided to just really share my unfiltered pain going through that. And whenever I encounter something challenging, you know, which, or, or whenever I have an epiphany or some big realization that's really true about life, which generally never comes because I'm sitting you know, in perfect meditation and in lotus on my yoga mat. And I realize everything about life, like it always comes through some challenge, through grief, through pain, through fear, through insecurity. And when I share that in a really unfiltered way, um, what I think I do is, is I really give people permission to feel those feelings, Mm -hmm. which is a little bit different than, oh, you know, I'm, I'm not feeling great about my body today. Um, you know, I, I had moments where I didn't know if I wanted to wake up tomorrow and I, and I would share that just in that sense. Um, so I think that kind of really unfiltered truth, no matter what I'm a, I don't know if you're into astrology, but I'm a Sagittarius rising. I am just like that as a person. It doesn't work for everyone, but I get a lot of, a lot of response from people who are moving through challenging things, saying that they find solace, that they find a place of comfort in reading what I write when I'm in those places. So it's not really just about, you know, if you look at my presence online now, it's mostly, it's mostly feelings, to be honest. It's gardening, it's motherhood, um, it's well-being, but from that level of heart, you know. Yes. Um, and that's, that's a place I, I try to stay. It's much less yoga poses now. I can't remember the last time I took a photo <laughs> of a yoga pose just to share, just like that, you know, because it's not really what my life looks like anymore. Yes. And for your online classes right now, how often are you teaching? I'm assuming you film them and you're, you're putting those out online, but for people that were interested or wanted to at least find out more about it, what does that look like in terms of a practice? Can you pick the number of days that you would um, complete them? Can you move through levels? 
Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we have thousands of classes on yogagirl.com. Um, when the pandemic started, I did daily meditations, um, daily practices um, for people and thousands of people joined in. It was really kept me sane in the early days of, of, of crazy time. Um, but now I do about once a week, um, I do a live class and then that yeah. content stays on the site. So there's always something new. And we have other teachers too. We have teachers from all over the world um, who I feel share our really heart centered um, practice. So there's a lot of choices and options there. And then we do this retreat, which was really, really fun to create where basically a seven day complete immersion with food and recipes included and, um, different kinds of meditations and journaling practices and gratitude practices mixed in with the yoga, which has been really fun because it's been a way to share yoga in that intensity with people without them having to leave their home, Yes, uh, which I think is something we all need right now. For sure. When, when did that take place? Uh, it's available on the site at any time. So we designed oh, it, it in a way so you can start today or you can start next week uh, or whenever it fits you. And then you, uh, yeah, you buy the retreat and then you have it forever. So we already have people who've done it several times as a way to <laughs> to stay anchored. So it's been it's it's been wonderful, I think. I don't know how you feel about that, but being in the field of, of wellness, of health overall at this time, um, it's been a good feeling being able to offer something that really is helpful to people right now. No, and we've, I agree. We, we've had to make a lot of shifts in how we do things, but luckily, I mean, I can't even imagine if this pandemic was here 15 years ago and we did not have the ability to communicate through Zoom. And I mean, I was probably using what Skype maybe 15 years ago, but not, not to this degree. And uh, it just would have been so much more challenging. So, you know, the silver lining, I look at it as that we're able to see people still all over the world, uh, right over video. We're still able to get people digital programs and ship things digitally. It's not ideal. I mean, I love getting a group of people together in person, feeling that energy exchange. But when it's not possible, I mean, this is a great second best option, you know, as well. And then in terms of online workouts, online yoga, I think it's fantastic. And I think it's here to stay. I know it's been here before, but people's lives are so busy. Like I just think of my life and how crazy it is and how many different things there are trying to balance, you know, being a husband, a father, a uh, son, all these different things. And then having my work, it's like, well, I want my exact class to start from let's say 5 48 in the morning and end at 6 12 and like i don't know that there's any other class out there oh and by the way i don't have enough time to commute there and from and take a shower so i just wanted then so that's why i just for me virtual is something that I really do enjoy and then when i could say okay once a week though i want that connection and then i'm going to go there for that connection so yeah i i agree and, and i think we just have to make the best of it right now that we can and being able to do a retreat on your own right now with the amount of anxiety and fear uh that's so pervasive in our, our world uh, i couldn't couldn't be better for sure absolutely yeah no i fully fully agree I would like to ask you about, and I always like to ask this question, and I try to think of everything always from the beginning. So you've been doing this a long time, and and I always think of like, okay, what I'm doing, I've been, what am I missing to try to teach beginners? What what are the biggest mistakes or things you say you see from someone that's never had a meditation practice or a yoga practice? What are the mistakes that they most often make that we could try to save them from making at least a couple of those? <sighs> I think one that, that really comes to mind right now also with the state of the world is we expect yoga or meditation to fix everything that's wrong in our lives. You know, there's so much of that message of yoga saved my life, meditation changed my life. And then we approach the practice like here's this thing, this golden opportunity for everything to get better. And oftentimes that's not what happens right away. You know, so to approach it more as a, here's an amazing tool that I can add to my toolbox of resources and practices that help me with different things in my life. Um, because there's this expectation of, and I think also now social media has kind of warped this a little bit, almost like, like yoga somehow is going to heal all of your trauma. Like yoga is going to therapy. Like yoga is, you know, yoga is what you make it. 
Yoga depends completely on the kind of teachers that you have, depends a lot on community. And we don't have that anymore in that sense, being able to go to a studio and be surrounded and held um, by people when you're going through something hard. So uh, lowering the expectations, I think a little bit of of what it is you're going to get from the practices, because when it doesn't change your life right away, or it requires discipline, it requires consistency, um, then I think people go, oh, it wasn't that great you know, let me look for the next life changing thing. When actually yoga, you know, it's a slow, it's like the long, the long game, you know, it really, really, really is. And approaching it from a sense of here's an opportunity for me to meet myself every day, versus here's an opportunity for me to feel great every day, because it's not like that. And if you think that that meditation is going to make you feel great or fix everything versus here's an opportunity for me to be with what is here and to process what is here, because sometimes you come to the mat and it's really hard and it's re- and you're really sad and you just want to cry. And then if you don't give yourself space for that, because you want your yoga mat to be a place where everything is awesome, you know, where I just feel great all the time, you're going to feel like something's wrong, like you're not doing yoga right and I think giving ourselves permission to cry in, as we practice, to, to feel anger, to feel frustration, to acknowledge that we feel fear and insecurity or we feel small or insignificant, like all of that belongs just as much as the feeling of peace, which of course also is going to be there, or, or the feeling of gratitude or more compassion or um, stillness, like all of those things. But I, I think getting away from just looking for the what we call the good stuff, you know, just looking for the peace. Uh, when actually, when we get into our practice, we get into ourselves, and we're going to find this whole tapestry of, of 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 emotion and of different kinds of experiences, and they're all valid. So to not look at it as a quick fix and as a direct avenue to awesome, you know, which sometimes it will be like, of course, there's going to be days where you, you practice yoga or you leave your meditation practice and you go, oh, thank God, like this was awesome. Um, but there's going to be days when it's really hard and when it's a struggle and where you're going to have to dig a little deeper in for, for that discipline to really commit and to continue to. Yeah, and one one word that kept coming up was practice, and I and I agree the same thing. Meaning, like, it is a practice that you set up for yourself, and that I think means different things to different people. But a, a practice is something that you go through, whether you have energy or don't have energy, that you're happy, you're sad, and it's just something that you've committed to. And the act of committing to something that betters you it can be a fantastic thing over the long term. Because um, you've made that commitment and it's also time to yourself. So you, of course, you can do it with other people, partners, family, et cetera. But it's at least time away from the the typical day to day, the mundane, the, all the things that you typically have to do. And that's time you've set aside for yourself. And if you look at it as instead of it has to bring you peace, but rather instead self-awareness and, and just bring going within, I think that's that's really what we can hope for. And and it can be a path to healing, meaning that yoga can open up what it is that you are supposed to do next. And, and in and of itself, meaning that um, it's amazing for the nervous system, for the lymphatic system, for your, like you just felt with your lower back. Uh, but for a lot of people after they've healed the injury or whatever it might be, they might then want to stop. And, and I don't think that that that's actually the, the time where like, okay, you've seen the benefits. Let's continue going. So the next question I have for you is what is the number of days that you would like to see people? I'm assuming meditation should be daily, but what about yoga? I think daily too. I mean, people ask me this question a lot and I really think you benefit more from 15 minutes every day than you do from a big, sweaty, 90 minute practice once a week. Um, So really having it be that consistency of I'm giving myself this gift of my presence, of something constructive, even if I'm not feeling it today. Um, so rolling out the mat and stepping on the mat and on days when we feel like, oh, I don't have time or this is hard today. Okay. Let me do one thing. You know, let me find, let me lie here in child's pose and just be here. And usually that one thing leads to another thing, you know, or we can commit to a class that's really short. Okay. I'm going to take a 10 minute class today online, or I'm going to follow this sequence that I found in the book, but just that we have that routine of, yeah, returning every day. And maybe even if we can, I know it's, it's hard now with, 
having kids at home and everything in the pandemic, but if we can have it at the same time every day. So it becomes kind of like, like it's drilled into our system that we brush our teeth in the morning. Like we should have it drilled into our system that we sit in silence in the morning, that we roll out our mat and we stretch in the morning, that we have those things that we feel really, really benefit us. So a little bit every day, I think goes a longer way than a lot once in a blue moon. Yeah, hundred percent. I agree with that. Especially in the beginning, you need to set it up as a practice and anything that you do daily, uh, you're more likely to stick with. So I, th- I think that's, you know, absolutely great advice. Where do you see now, uh, regardless of the pandemic, I, I do hope that we're of course out of this soon, but where do you see yoga moving to in the future? What, what do you see it morphing into or, or is it more of the same? Is it more, um, one on, you know, one for yourself or, or do we get into larger groups? You're in this and I'd love to hear your perspective because I don't actually know. It's always been, it, everything always has to grow in this world, right? It has to change. It has to morph. And so I'm just wondering what happens to yoga? I mean, there's a lot that's happened to yoga in the past in the past couple of decades, especially in the last decade, that hasn't necessarily been really good, I think. Mm-hmm. I think with the explosion of, of, of the popularity of yoga in the West, um, the practice has also become really whitewashed. We have a lot of issues with um, representation, with diversity um, in the yoga industry and in the wellness industry. And speaking as a white woman, you know, who had a really easy time actually getting to this place in my career and as a teacher, I really hope that the future of yoga returns to the Indian and South Asian roots from where it came. And that when when you tell someone, oh, I have a yoga practice, that the other person immediately knows, oh, there's more to yoga than what happens on a yoga mat. Mm-hmm. That asana is just one of the eight limbs and that the other limbs are just as important, just as valid and can change your life in maybe even a bigger way than the asana practice can. So I'm really hoping, and I'm, I'm, and I'm we're seeing this movement now also in, in, in many different ways, but I'm hoping that activism can play a bigger role and that people re- learn that there's more to yoga than a downward dog in a handstand. Mm-hmm. And that's where I hope yoga is going in the future. And then in terms of groups and things like that, it's a, it's a really hard, hard, hard thing. You know, I would love to go back to leading teacher trainings and retreats. We have a studio here in Aruba where I live. Um, and the studio is doing terribly, you know, online things are going wonderfully, thank goodness, but locally, uh, because we can't have people here, of course, you know, it mm-hmm. doesn't work. So we've experimented with, can we put something on the, on the calendar and create a bubble? Is that going to be something that happens in the future where you create a bubble where no one goes in and out and that becomes a safe space or is it going to be, yeah, I really don't know. Something that just lives in the online space forever. I miss the physical components of touch, of hugs, of intimacy, of um, sitting in circle together for real, you know, because yes. because the Zoom and the online and yogagirl.com, I'm so grateful for it. And it's so beautiful, but it, it, it's not the same, of course, as the magic that happens in a room together. But who knows? What if this is two more years? Are we not going to have any any retreats, you know, for the coming years? It's also hard mm. to fathom as well. We need that physical connection. So... Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Hopefully. I hope we yeah, I hope we just don't forget what that mm. was like. Cuz what happens is that over time those memories just aren't as strong and we just get we humans are very amazing at adapting and we just okay, well this is this is our new normal and at least for me, again, it could be someone else's new normal. We can all experience our own our own way in this life and our own path, our own journey. Uh to me it just doesn't feel normal. And I don't want it to ever be normal. I don't want to be afraid like you just said to give someone a hug or a hand handshake or whatever it might be, uh, because then we do become too much like robots. I mean, we just be our behind the screen. And, um, and, and even like I used to, I, I would say twice a month for about six months, seven, seven months out of the year, I'd be going and be on people's podcasts and get to meet all sorts of great people in the industry. And you just learn so much that way as well. So you learn more, you teach more, you share more and you develop all these great experiences. So, uh, it's just, it's just my take on it. And in terms of, um, you know, I love that you said, and then again, I had no idea that we were going to say that uh, about yoga, not forgetting about where it came from, its roots, its history. It's so rich. Um, and, and that's how we feel about Ayurveda as well. And of course, yoga being one of the branches in, in Ayurveda. But 
I'm just a lot of times in the U S we make it into like fun little games and quizzes and things like that. I'm like, I'm like, this is kind of disrespectful to the oldest form of medicine and really philosophy in the world. And I just, I just think that, you know, people like yourself and others that have a big reach can do a lot to share with people. Like, this is where it came from. Let's not forget that, even though we like to simplify it. In the West, we like to do two things. One is compete, and the second is to simplify it to almost nothing. And mm. um, and I don't think either one is necessarily positive. So hopefully you keep on your mission of, of sharing, you know, where yoga came from, what it's really meant to be. And I think that'll be really helpful. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I really hope so. And on that, on that note, I mean, there is... Uh, what, what I do feel we do in the West as well is we either glamorize practices that aren't part of our heritage or we sterilize them. Mm. This is something I learned from an amazing teacher, everyone listening, if you want to learn more about um, how to create diversity and really honor the roots of yoga. One of my teachers, Susana Barkataki, um, does courses and lots of amazing social media content around this as well, where um, we're always struggling to find that balance. How can I honor the roots of the practice without glamorizing it or almost like, um, you know, stepping into a culture that isn't my own or appropriating culture that isn't my own versus how can I, you know, make sure I'm not sterilizing the practice and removing all of the sacred roots um, that make the practice what it is, because otherwise we're just, what are we doing? You know, we're doing aerobics or something in a, in a workout class, like where is the yoga in that? So, it, and it's really a personal thing, I think, to, to navigate, to make sure that we're honoring all these practices in, in, in the best way possible. Yeah. And, and just always, I would say, paying homage to those people, the shoulders that you stand on. And that's, I'm always going back, I'm talking about, you know, who I learned from and, and my mentor, who I was given the opportunity to even learn about a lot of this from. And, and they, of course, then learned it from, you know, two generations removed from India and Ayurveda. And that's how I look at it. It's like, you know, I didn't go to school in India to become an Ayurvedic doctor, but I learned it through, uh, one generation removed from someone who learned from that Ayurvedic doctor and they were a naturopathic doctor themselves. So it's just, it's really nice in, in my own way to just say, uh, this is where it comes from. And just like you, here, here are other people that you can go and you can explore that to even a, a deeper degree. And that is, again, one of the nice things about online is that if you're willing to do a little bit of that deeper research, you can find things that, you know, we would not have been able to access just 15 years ago as well. So that's, that's pretty, that's a pretty amazing thing, but I'd love to hear, um, to what you feel kind of that next step is because you have so many great options for people to engage with you. Um, you've got the, well, let's start here. You have the yoga girl podcast. Tell us a little bit about, uh, that podcast, how often it is and what you talk about on the show. Yeah, I have two podcasts. Actually, I have the yoga girl podcast that it's out once a week, every Friday. And, um, it's really, I have guests on sometimes, but it's really, a, a, a podcast about, about healing and healing from the heart. So it's a mixture of storytelling with really great advice on rituals and how to incorporate the practices that I use in my life to, to get to that place of, of feeling whole. But then I also have a daily podcast, which is a five minutes. It's called yoga girl daily. We do journaling prompts and meditations and gratitude practices, and it's five minutes it's every single day. And, uh, it's fun. It's fun. We have 40 million something downloads now. So it's really been one of those things where in quarantine, you can really tell people the things that used to be practices that were a little bit luxurious, you know, it's like, Oh, I got to go to yoga today, you know, mm -hmm. have become non-negotiable. We can't make it without having these practices in place. And it doesn't have to be that hour of yoga every day. It doesn't even have to be yoga. You know, for some people mm -hmm. it's, running or dancing or gardening or cooking, that we have that outlet of, of really nourishing ourselves, our bodies, our spirits, our hearts. And um, yeah, it's so important that we find that for ourselves in a way that works for ourselves. Because it doesn't have to be yoga. And I share that too. Like just because it's yoga for me doesn't have to be for everyone, but that we found that thing that works for ourselves is a really important one. That, that's great advice for sure. But if people did want to get started on a yoga practice and really pick and choose what they feel classes are best for them, uh, they can go to yogagirl.com. Is that correct? 
Yes, yogagirl.com. And we have lots of variations, everything from taking your first class ever beginner to if you want to really sweat and have something dynamic to if you want to do breath work um, or meditations and everything in between. And there's a lovely community there too. We have a community space where you can share about your day. And um, again, that component of feeling less alone, which is something I try so hard to keep and capture on the internet. Um, So we at least have a semblance of that feeling um, even from home as well. Yeah. So yeah, and you you guys do a really a fantastic job uh, with that, I think too. And in the community, of course, shows across social media. What are your social media handles for people to connect with you? So on Instagram, yoga underscore girl. And uh, that's pretty much the only one I use right now. On Facebook, I have a Facebook page called Yoga Girl. So Yoga Girl mm-hmm. all around is it. Excellent. Any parting advice and wisdom you'd like to share with the community? Oh, how sweet. I mean, I always come back to, and also as a self-care practice, to be of service in any way we can, you know, whether that is today making sure that we're of really great service to our children, um, or if we have the ability to be of monetary service, to donate to people in need, or to be of service in our community somehow, to just have that looking and know that it's part of our self-care is to also have our hearts and our eyes around um, in the world around us as well. So it's not just me and mine and how am I feeling, but how are we all doing? And I feel you're doing such a good job at that. So thank you for sharing such a beautiful space with this podcast and all the work you do too. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. It was great having you on here today. I know that our community is going to get a lot out of it and uh, we hope to chat with you again soon. Thank you so much for having me. 